are good and your mercies endure forever. Lord, you are good and your mercies endure forever. Lord, you are good and your mercies endure forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. 
I just want to read uh, a few scriptures. It says, Behold, from Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief, and blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he be walk naked and they see his shame. You know, I read that on Friday night before serv- uh, the youth meeting started and I thought oh okay it fits Um, and then Sharon come up and share what God put upon her heart and she had to just kind of remember by memory because she misplaced her well all her stuff went disappeared but God's funny that way sometimes but what she shared She said about being ready. Be ready. She gave some examples of something that God showed her. But anyway, I believe 
that this is what God has for me to share so we may be ready. Just as a reminder, it's nothing you haven't heard before. But sometimes, you know, you can read the word and read the word and you're just reading the word. And then some, sometimes it was like, oh, God's talking to me in that verse. So I will read and I will share what I failed to share at this time. And um, in, ver in Luke 12, 40, it says, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So I want to be ready. The young people came up here. The older ones came up here Friday night. We want to be ready for whatever God has. We don't want to miss what he has. We want him to take us on. We don't want to be those that stay back and miss what God has for this generation. And he takes us step by step. You know, it's not all... He can come suddenly, but... He's usually building, 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 building. And some thoughts that came to me, which I thought, oh, I don't want to go on that subject, but I'm going to do it anyway. And it has to do with our natures. We have two natures if we're Christians. We all know we have Adam's nature, the sin nature, uh, whatever you want to call it. But we also have God's nature if we've given our heart to God. So we, we, it's not easy to be a Christian. Those that are not Christians, just living their life, doing what their nature tells them to do. They don't have any conviction of sin. They don't have anybody they have to necessarily obey unless they choose to. But a Christian has two natures and one answers to the Lord and the other. <laughs> we just, uh, but uh, what do I say? Other than the fact that on the cross, God defeated our sin nature, but we still have it there. It's still within us. It's still there. And um, in Romans 8, Verses 1, it says, there, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Yes, it's true. But sometimes it don't seem like it's true. Because I don't know about you, but my experience starting when I was young in the Lord until now, the battle goes on and the flesh is there. And we have a choice as Christians. The Lord has set us free from, there are the sins of the flesh, but there is attitudes, there are Many sins besides just the ones people normally think of, which are the fleshly ones. And what I found that is the, the more I go on, as time goes by, that that never quits. The struggle. God will bring more light in another area and sing, oh, see, you got a problem with this. What are you going to do? And it tells, we know that we're supposed to die daily, pick up our cross and walk. And they go, okay, yeah, this is true. In Romans 8, 7, it says, because the carnal mind is at enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So there it is. It's an enmity. It's against God. It's against whatever God wants. 
it can't be, it's not going to like, okay, disappear and now I'm good, you know. I just walk an upright life. That's why so many times you see people walking with the Lord and they're doing good and then seemingly over time they drift away or they go totally back into the world because that, that nature is still there. Even though it's dead, ultimately it's dead, but we struggle. At least I struggle. So I'm giving you my experience, and this is why I thought, okay, I don't want to talk about this. But I know that the more I go on, the more God will, something I would think, oh, that's not so bad. And he didn't really, he didn't press upon it in my younger years, but now he will press more upon it. I said, okay. And... Um, And the scriptures also in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So yes, we're to do this, but how do we do that? Well, Only by the Spirit. I can't tell you how many times trying to do it in my own effort, trying to walk the straight and narrow and then find myself, oh, there I go off. And then come under condemnation for my actions, my sin, and come back, God help. I mean, God will use that in my life to keep me coming back to him. But he's going to present his son. There's going to be a bride that is spotless. And when I look at myself, I say, oh, look at all the spots. The spots being sin. So my thoughts on this is we come daily. Well, this is what I know to do, to come daily and say, Lord, forgive me, wash me of all my sins. Thank you for the blood that you have provided that I may have forgiveness of my sins. And Holy Spirit, change my heart that it would be a pure heart. And Lord, it's not you, it's not me, it's you that does the work. And like I said, over and over and over again, I would start and fall, get back up and start and fall, and start and fall, and keep going and keep going. But over years, There'd be progression, but there's still so much more. You know, and as you know, we're in a war, and we don't have a choice. Like, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to be in this war. I'm done. Unless you want to just go off and be pulled in back into the world, which when you do that, you become separated from the Lord. And I don't know about you. I don't want that. I don't want to be separated from him. I want to hear his voice. I want to be led by him. I want to know him. I want to know his heart. I want to be like him and not with this body of flesh, the, 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 uh, the nature that I was born with. And I heard this, which was interesting. He, someone said that Adam was born without a sinful nature. And yet, when it came time where he disobeyed God, and then there it was. Our struggle, we're born with it. He chose to disobey.
So for us, we already have that nature in us. But yes, it is dead in Christ. Ultimately, it's been done. But we're looking at, watching it happen as we go on with the Lord. But I can't tell you how many times that would keep me from going closer to the Lord because I self-condemnation. So what's the use? Give it up. What's the use? But he'd bring these things in my life that I realize he is my only hope. I cannot change myself. I can't make myself do the right thing. I can't have that hunger and run after God unless he put it there. And so that's all the spirit, his spirit that works in us. And I can remember so many times we'd have services. This is when I was a young man. And well, beyond, but even beyond. But the fact of coming and just reaching out, God, I need you, I need you. And I'd be dead. Nothing. No sense that God was hearing me. But then I didn't realize that God was also in the midst of that putting some, put something in my heart that kept going. I, had to, I didn't give up. Though I would give up, but not ultimately give up, is what I mean. How many times in service, and then I get, I'd just, I'd try, and I'd come to the front, and I'd just do what everyone else was doing. I'm trying, trying, and then nothing. So I'd go back down and sit down, get discouraged, and think, ah. But through it all, he is working in those that belong to him. Even when I backslide, he's always going, come, come back. You're not content, you, you're not at peace. You can't be at peace, because I'm not gonna let you be at peace. Thank you, Lord, for not letting me be at peace with my condition. So that nature, that Adam's nature, sin nature, is there with us. And we're not going to drop it until we drop this body. When we go on to eternity, it's gone forever. Praise God. Praise God. But while I'm here, I still will have to battle. And the closer I get, the more God starts to, okay, now this, I've got to deal with this. It says in Galatians 6, 8, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So this is a choice we make every day. Okay, am I going to sow to my flesh and all do, do all things I know I shouldn't? Because for the moment it might seem pleasurable or... Oh, I'm good or whatever, but, uh, or am I going to sow to the spirit? How do I sow to the spirit? Well, one way is, is being in the word. Well, I can't tell you how many times I'd read the word and read the word and just nothing seems to be speaking to me. I just, I'm, I'm going nowhere with this through the years. And yet I, God put something in my heart to keep on going. And when things got rough in the natural, when things were happening, if God was shaking things, God started to work in me to, to reach out or reach to him more, to come to a place that, okay, God, I got to do more than I'm doing. But I've tried through the years, tried and tried and tried. And now over and over again, and I would, like I said, feel condemned about my lack, my lack of love, my lack of desire, my lack of wanting to know him more. Well, I don't know. I don't know, I don't have the answer to this other than I, I always think I wanted to, 
know him more, but I wasn't willing to put the work in, what it took. And yet, there was something there that God put in my heart. Nothing of me, because the more you go on, the more you realize you, there's nothing good in you except the Holy Spirit. And I know I'm not telling most, if not all, nothing new. But um, let me read Colossians 3, 1 through 5. It says, if then, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry, unbelief, how much do we realize the sin of unbelief? And how do we accept it? Oh, okay, yeah, I don't believe. But that's not pleasing to the Lord. There's so many things. Like I said, it's in the sins of the flesh, much easier than the others. Pride. So this, my life struggle, all of us that belong to the human race that are his, that have given their hearts to God, have placed it in his hands to bring us there. And as we were singing this morning, you know, well, let me leave that for a second. It says, therefore, in Corinthians 7, it says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, to let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Yes, all these, all these things are nice, you know. I've read them over and over again through the years. But having them perform, have that come about is another thing for me anyway. I don't know about the rest of you. I know you're near perfection, but um, I myself have struggled all through. And sometimes they're just nice words. Oh, that's, yeah, that's nice, but it doesn't go to my heart. Where God, cry out to God to change me. Because I do want to be, I do want to walk with you, my, and I do want to be ready for whatever you have. But yes, Lord, deal with my sins. Holy Spirit, you are the one that empowers me to be able to. You're the one that sets the prisoner free. You're the one that breaks the chains that hold us. But it all has to come, which you've heard me talk about before, which is that secret place with him. That is where the, bond, the bonds are broken. In our relationship with him, but you know, for me, it was for me, and it doesn't have to be for everyone. It was only through difficult times without seemingly any answers. And my prayers seemed to me bounce off the walls and nothing would change. Things went from worse to worse to worse to worse to worse. But in it, also, God put in me the fact that he's my only hope. I'm only going to get my answer. I'm only that which I need. I'm only going to get from you. And it's just not saying a prayer. It's not until you're in the presence of the Lord. And so our endeavor is to draw near to him. 
And also, yes, there is a making a, di a discipline of seeking his face, but in such a world that we live that is so difficult, so busy. We are so busy. Busy with this, busy with school, busy with work, busy with cleaning the house. Well, not my case, but uh, anything. Oh, I got this, I got this sports thing, I got that and all. So it's not an easy task. But even in that, God, the Holy Spirit, works on us to bring us to the place to make our priorities and set our priorities. Like I said, there is no condemnation in Christ. He doesn't condemn us. He knows our human struggle. And I can remember many a time just coming forward and, Lord, if I'm not willing, make me willing. Because I know in me, I've shown it over and over again, I'm not willing. But I don't want to be left this way because I want to know you. I don't want to live this life and be sorry that I didn't seek his face and come to know him. And so I press this, and I know I've said it over and over again at uh, different times at the youth meetings, and I can only say even... Uh, especially for our youth because they're young and when you're young you think you have you got, you got forever and you don't realize whether your life be short or long you don't know but to God for God to bring us to that place and say, all right, Lord, I want to seek your face. I want to be consistent. I may sometimes, and then because of life, things get in the way or lack of desire. I just don't care. Or I'm tired or I'm this or I'm that. And God is patient, God is merciful and gracious to me. But it is in that place where it's just you and him talking, sharing, and if you're griping or complaining, it's not a problem with the Lord because he knows your heart anyway. You can be blunt, honest with him. And if he wants to slap you around, he will to wake you up. We can trust the Lord to, to get done. But he loves us to come. He loves us to come. And when we come, and seemingly I'm getting nowhere, he loves the fact that you keep coming. And you want to be there when it's say, okay, now. And there he is. You might have struggled all week, all month, maybe years, I don't know. But he's faithful. He has promised those that will seek me shall find me if they search for me with all their heart. And what I find is I don't search for him with all my heart. That's some of my heart. Because I find even now that I've been off, it's like, oh, I have so much more time to pray and read my Bible. And I find that part of me does and then... Okay, I'm done. I, I, can't, I can't read another word. Or, you know, I have my limits. But I do know that that's what's going to keep us, especially in the times we are living. As Americans that have been pampered and covered and kept through the generations, and now we're seeing this change in our world, in our, our country, that makes you go, wow, what's, you know, what's next? And me, I mean, I'm going to be 70, and I don't know how much longer I'll live. I could be like my uncle who lived to 95. But even still, uh, the importance of having that relationship, not just for that, because 
what you discover when you make that commitment is you, he comes to you, he changes the cry, your complaints or your fears or your, your, your bondages, your sins. This is where you find the change. This is where he changes the heart. This is where he gives you a different heart. This is where he suddenly, you're, well, maybe not suddenly, but uh, more and more, that love that is him, he puts in your heart. Love for others, and especially in our time, in a world that is basically selfish, it's all about me and my. I know there's exceptions, and that's, I believe, because of things God has put people through. And but my point of it is, it's in that secret place that we are changed. The word of truth, the word of God, who is Jesus, is what makes the difference. So my desire is just to encourage you and myself because I'm speaking to myself. And I know that my only hope to be changed, to be made law like him, is in his presence where he speaks to me. That's where my prayers are emboldened. That's where you find the answers. So I just want to encourage young and old, no matter how many years you've been walking with the Lord, to press on in. And no matter how many times you may, may fall to just get back up on your feet and do it again and do it again and do it again. Come, make that time, make that commitment, whether it's at the night or the morning or the afternoon while you're driving, while you're washing your dishes or whatever you're doing. In this time in our world, we, we're going to need that more than any other generation in this country. Because you've seen the evidence of it. You see the darkness that's come. But he'll be a light unto us. The world will be engrossed in darkness, but not his people. Because they know their God. But how do you know your God? By spending time with your God, by talking to your God. How do you know when you, when you met your uh, spouse or it was through those conversations and that someone was telling me the other night about talking on the phone, you talk to that person, they talk for hours and hours and hours. Well, that's the same way basically that we get to know the Lord. And yes, we do have busy lives. I say again, I know there is, but you do the best you can. God knows. And sometimes, like I said, I didn't want to. I just didn't want to. I didn't have the desire. It's like, ah, I'm tired. I want to go do that. Oh, and it showed my priorities, that the Lord was not my priority all the times. I'd rather go do this or do that. And... Um, we are in the fight. So yes, we are fighting against those things. But we have the Holy Spirit who never gives up. And it's not us, like I said, changing ourselves. I've made that commitment over and over again and then just failed. But then as you continue on and getting up and getting up and you find yourself doing things that you couldn't do years ago. Because God did something in the heart because you kept coming. And then when you meet with the Lord, there's nothing like it. Everything gets shut out when you are in his presence. That's our aim, to be in his presence, to love him, to know him, to be used for whatever his purposes are. For he has called us. We didn't go to him. He came to us. He called you out. You didn't choose him. He chose you. He didn't choose, I didn't choose him. He chose me. I wasn't happy as a young person. I was miserable at a young, as a young person. But it wasn't until I was like 20, 22, 
21, 22, that God started drawing my heart. Actually, I think there were seeds and different things as in my younger years. I remember having desire to try to read the word of God and couldn't do it because I didn't understand it at all. And there was little things that I wanted God to prove himself to me. But then as life goes on, you get caught up in doing your thing. But my point of saying that is that when God's appointed time is for you and for me, which you all know, he called. I said, okay, that's enough. I need your cooperation. All this time I've been preparing you, planted seeds. People would water them. But likewise, earlier I said at 22, I had people come up to me and start sh telling me about Jesus. And I said, I called home when I lived in New York. I had lived in New York and moved to Texas at that time. And I thought, what is it in Texas? Everybody, I've never had somebody witness to me and tell me about Jesus. I said, well, it must be Texas because it's the Bible Belt. Because in New York, I never, never. But anyway, it was, but it was freakish because my buddy, nobody was doing that to him. And he'd been living there longer than I have. And uh, so, point is that he's, he had an appointed time for calling each of us. And he's very patient with us, loves us. He knows our struggle, like I said. But he's for us and not against us. He's given us weapons, how to battle the enemy. Because the battlefield, as you know, is in the mind. Whether we're going to believe the enemy or whether we're going to believe God. Are we going to take God at his word or are we going to believe that little voice in us that says, oh, there's no hope for you. You're too bad. You're, you're too, too, uh, yeah, you're just too stubborn and God can't change that. But there's one thing that I wanted to read after that which I'm going to read piece by piece, which has spoke to me, and I have mentioned this before in years past. But when I came to the Lord, I was living in Dallas, Texas, and this little lady led me to Christ. She was a Catholic lady that had came to know the Lord. And back then, that was the only person I would listen to. So God knew to send this little Catholic lady to me who wor worked with me at Texas Instruments. But anyway, when I went with her to church that first day, and God just, phew, the heavens seemed to open to me, and God was there. And this, someone prayed out or prophesied out, or he, and I didn't realize what he was, what he, this person, I can't remember if it was a man or a woman. But anyway, it was Psalm 91. And this psalm means a lot to me. And I knew that that song was, that psalm that was, that word that was like spoken, this place that I was in was like seated about 2,000 people. Maybe if that, I'm not sure. It was a very big place. Actually, it was an auditorium off a of bowling alley. And it was, the place was called Beverly Hills Baptist Church. It was a charismatic Baptist church. But anyway, this word came forth and it says in verse 1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Notice, he who dwells in the secret place. So that's our prayer closet. That's us coming. Just you and God, me and God. What does it say about it? We shall abide under his shadow. The shadow of the almighty God. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him, 
I will trust. We don't realize how much we trust in our own abilities. We don't, don't realize we might trust in other people. We might trust in a minister. We may trust in our husband, our wife. But the Lord is the one that you can trust. Others will disappoint because they're just people like you and me. They're not God. He's your refuge in those times that you need to hide. Hide in him. Go to him. He is your fortress. What does the fortress do? He protects you. You're behind the walls of the fortress where the enemy is on the outside and you're on the inside. But yet, you know, we also have an enemy in us. Like I said earlier, we have that sinful nature. So we have that battle going on in our heart. But you know what? The Lord keeps us, even though we have an enemy, our flesh in us. He will keep us, but we must go to him. We must look to him. Verse 3 says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. He is our deliverer. Are you bound? Does the enemy have you caught up in something that you cannot Break free from. He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence, disease. Not just natural diseases. Poison mines. You know the power of the word. And we can share something with someone and poison them. One is not the Lord speaking through you. And you can mess with their heads. And suddenly their opinions change because it went in. But how do we, how do we battle against that? Those arrows in our heart. Those self-condemnation or, or poison about another person or gossip. Gossip. And leaves a deposit in your heart. It affects the way you think. And you may, if, you, if it was about a person, it affects the way you look at that person because, oh, you heard this. And that makes you look at them differently. But he will deliver you from it. He will keep you. He will take the poison out. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. His truth. He is truth. What is truth? The word is truth. I mean that spoken word to you. I don't mean just reading the word in the Bible, and there, okay, there's the word, I read it. But when he speaks it to you personally, but you must read it in order for him to speak it to you. Faith comes by hearing. When you hear him, when you hear him speaking to you, I can't tell you how many times that someone would be on the pulpit and they would share something and it was like all of a sudden, I didn't hear nothing else, but that word that came forth from that minister and it's not always ministers, but came forth. And I knew that was God speaking to me about that little phrase. But it was truth. And the truth shall set us free. You know, we think we might be ourselves or... You know, I might not belong to God, I belong to myself. No, you're either on one side or the other. If you're living unto yourself, you're not, on your, you're not living unto yourself. You're living unto, for the enemy without realizing it. People don't say, oh, yes, I love being under the devil. Well, I know there's some people that, that uh, declare that, 
But on the most part, people are just living their lives. But the truth is what will set you free. So you're not a prisoner. You become a slave. Either you're a slave to the enemy or you're a slave to God. I'd rather be a slave to God because God is not a hard taskmaster. Our God is a loving, merciful, gracious God. It's when we fight him that we, we fight against what he wants. We might struggle, but I don't know about you, and I'm pretty sure most of you, if not all, don't want to be the slave to the enemy. We want to be a slave to the Lord. I love slaves. Not because I have to, not because he wards it over me, but he so reveals his love as we continue to talk to him, come to him. And all we do is fall more in love with him. And we want to serve him. We want to live for him. We want to be his love slave. That's a work of the spirit in your heart over time. All he's looking for are willing vessels. You know, I, I, I was thinking about last uh, Friday night's meeting, and I saw these young people have been coming faithfully. Some are having, you know, some can make it at different times. Some can't. they got jobs, school, and stuff. But they're coming. They're making themselves available for the Lord. That says a lot. Whether they think they got anything out of the service that night they made themselves available and yes they're battling with the things within them while we're trying to reach out to the Lord in your mind you got this God give up no use you're not getting anywhere all different thoughts but anyway it's down it says here you shall in verse 5 not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Now that could be in the natural, and it could be within yourself. Fears and condemnation and The enemy loves to shoot arrows at us. But we do have the shield of faith to protect us. But we have to lift it up. You can't let it sit there and lay there. It says a thousand may fall at your side. And this, now that I saying this, I'm remembering back in 1970, 1978, that this stuck out the most to me when that person was, I don't know if you would say prophesying it. Well, I, could, I believe so because God was talking to me. And this one is part. A thousand may fall by your side, 10,000 at your right hand but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Which that has stuck with me. And you know, I've seen ones fall this way, that way. But in his mercy, Lord has been merciful and didn't let me stay there. When I would fall, he would pick me back up and say, okay, yes, you have sinned. I wash you and I will cleanse you. And another way of cleansing is through the word, water, washing with the water of the word, which is the truth. But his precious blood, powerful blood, that we really don't have a, 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 a much understanding of the power of the blood and what it's done and what it does. 
but may he reveal more and more to us. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. It's because you have made the Lord. So that's our part. We don't have to. He's not going to make us. He would desire for all. But because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. How do we interpret that? No. Well, this happened to me, that happened to me. That's evil. God let it happen to me. Well, God's allowed something that we see as evil to happen to us or a loved one or whatever, God means it for good because that's our God. He loves us so. He loves us so. And you know the scripture. He worketh all things for good. All things. Not some things, but all things. So that's something to hold on to, but of course, when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to hold on to these things. When everything's shaking around you and you don't know what, you don't know what you're going to do, how you're going to survive, whether you will survive, it's hard, yes. But this is where you get your comfort. This is where, in the secret place, is where you get everything that you need to continue on, to get up the next day, to continue on and do what God has called you to do, go where he wants you to go. So, because he has set his love on me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name, meaning known his nature, and that comes from being in that secret place. You come to know the nature of God. You come to know that he is not this God ready to beat you over the head, to beat you into submission. But he is a God that loves, not loves, he is love. And when he manifests and he draws near, he just, uh, he melts you. It's like liquid love. Liquid. It's like you're immersed in this love and nothing else matters. But then it the, goes on. We continue every day. And at last it says, He shall call upon me and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life and satisfy him and show him my salvation. He satisfies. So often people think, oh, the Christian, you know, they got to live a straight life. They got to do this and they don't get to satisfy. They're not satisfied. But no, it's those that are not that come to realize, maybe not everyone, those that will be his, to realize it's empty. All my ambitions, all I thought if I had this, I had that, I did that, if I became uh, powerful or successful, or whether God gives me a family, I will be content, I will be satisfied if I will have this or that. And what we come to realize over time is none of that satisfies our heart. It's good, fine. I'm not saying it's wrong. But if you make it and put it over him, yes, then it's wrong. And God will sometimes ask you to lay that down because it's keeping you from knowing him. It's being put before him. And anything we put before the Lord is an idol. 
something we look to, something we spend time more on that than our Lord. And I am guilty of doing that. All of these things, I am guilty. It says, with long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. He will show me his salvation. And we don't realize, when we think of salvation, we have a certain picture of what that means. Oh, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Oh, so much more. So much more he's saving us. I can't think of the scriptures right now, but I'll leave it alone, but about salvation. So, everything. He is able to keep us from falling. All it matters is you get back up and keep going. How many times you may fall and how many times God has made provision for us. For we are weak, but he is strong. And he's not finished with me, I know, and I know he's not finished with y'all. But he's getting us ready. Getting us ready. So, Lord, I just ask, oh God, that you make us ready. Make us ready for what's ahead. We want to be a part of what you're doing. We want you to be able to take us where you want to take us. Like we've said and prayed before, Lord, take me by the hand and lead me. Because I don't know where I'm going. I can't make me go but you can bring me there, Lord. Lord, I want to have a willing heart. And if I'm not willing, Lord, make me willing. Because I know, Lord, you are what satisfies. If I have nothing else, if I have you, I'm satisfied. If I find myself someday in a prison, locked up in, by myself, I am not by myself. You are with me. And I can be at peace. And I can rejoice. I may struggle back and forth, but when I come into your presence, I find my peace. I find my fulfillment. I find you. That's what we want. That's what we want. We want you. For you the one, Lord. My heart wants to long for. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. A right spirit. Don't let me re remain in stubbornness, unbelief, bitterness, uncleanness. You shall have a spotless bride. But it's all you, Lord. You just say, yield to the Spirit. Let me work it out in your life. You don't have to do anything but obey and yield. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But you are our answer, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because if it was left to me, it would never happen. I would be lost for all eternity. But yes, you are also a just God. And that penalty had to be paid for my sin, Lord. But you made provision through your son. You took my place, Lord. You so loved the world that you came. You obeyed your Father and came. It's God in you, Lord. You came and bore my sin. You took those stripes upon you. You wore that crown of thorns. You nailed in your hands and in your feet. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for drawing us. Thank you for calling us out of our sin and in our darkness, oh God. Because you aren't going to leave us there. You won't force yourself upon us. You're not going to make us, Lord, but you know our hearts. You created us. You know if we'll be willing. You know whether we need to go around that mountain one more time before we're willing. It's okay. You love us. And you will work and work and work. You lose not one, Lord, one, one that is destined to be yours, Lord. Praise you. Create in me a clean heart. That I may be clean before you, O oh God. That I would not hold on to anything, O oh God, but I would freely give. You will deal, you will deal with me. You will bring me to that place where I bow the knee. Thank you, Lord. But you don't leave me to myself. I give you praise. I give you thanks, Lord. So for each one, Lord, may they be encouraged because they have your, you gave them an answer for their every trouble, Lord. For you are that answer. The sin problem has been taken care of. Because you paid the price. You took my place. Thank you. I praise you. Thank you, Jesus. May we forever be reaching for more of you to know that heart. And to know you is to love you. Because when you reveal yourself, Lord, you can't help but love you. Those that are forgiven much, love much. And Lord, when we don't even realize our sinfulness, you place the light in time. You shine your light that we can see. You bring us further and further out of darkness, but we must come to you. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your holy name. There's none like you. I give you praise. I give you thanks. <laughs> Faithful and true. Forgiving a multitude of sin. Hallelujah. Wash us. Cleanse us. Make us ready for the next step. And ultimately, Lord, to meet with you. For you shall have a spotless bride. Without wrinkle, without spot. In the church, wash us. Make us ready. Give us hearts that are fast after you. Hungry hearts. Hungry for your word, for your truth. That we may not live unto ourselves, but live for you. That you may glorify your life in and through us, Lord. To a world that is in need. A world that is dying in darkness and in sin. You haven't left us here to be a trophy of what God can do. But Lord, you have a purpose for each life that you want to use them. You want to use them for your plan, for your purposes, because you so love the world you love. You've left us here that we may do your bidding, that we may serve you, that we may be your love slave, Lord. With joy in our hearts, it's not a burden, but a joy. 
Yes, Lord, you will make it a joy. It's up to you. It's up to us just to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. You're so good, so kind, and patient. You've been so patient with me, Lord. You would not take no for an answer. You know where I'd be, Lord, if you didn't walk into my life. I would have been lost. I would not be alive, I doubt it. Not with the way I was going, Lord. My life would have been snuffed out by now. But you have your plan and purpose for each life. It's not how great or how small that purpose may be in our eyes. All we want to hear, Lord, all I want to hear is, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my peace. Enter into my kingdom. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, bless each one. <laughs> Fill them with such a love for you. Each one, oh God, draw more and more to yourself. Put that longing, a dissatisfaction with the world, but with a love for you. To be wholly yours, to be all yours, because Lord, we belong to you. And you belong to us. This is not our destination. This is not our home. We're just passing through. We're looking for our heavenly home. You're making us ready. You're making your church ready. Take us on in. All the way, Lord. All the way, as far as you can take each one. And where you can take us, Lord, go beyond with our children, Lord. May they go further, further, further. And our grandchildren, Lord, forget not. No, you don't forget. For the blessings are for us and for our children and our great-grandchildren and children, great-children. Oh, I mean our grandchildren. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. May each one, each generation that is here, may they not miss you, Lord. May they not miss what you have for them. Not one, Lord, not one. We give you praise. I give you praise. Oh, thank you. Faithful and true. Almighty oh, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. A hopeless case, an empty place, if not for grace.